Uh, have, you ever, um, have you ever looked at a photo and had to do a double take? Have you ever looked at something and like wondered like, what is, what is really going on there? Here's what I mean. Like, for example, a photo like this. Um, does that girl have really skinny legs or is she holding a bag of popcorn? <laughs> Just a collective, ah. Oh. How about this one? Raise your hand if this looks like a really sweet concert. Anyone, this looks like a, what if I told you that was actually a combine collecting cotton? Look closely. Now you see it. Okay, this one I thought was really funny. Here's one from an airplane. And uh, the caption said, I thought this guy was staring at me all flight until I realized he put his sunglasses on the back of his head. Do you see it now? It's weird, right? Final one is this image right here. And if, um, if you look at this photograph <laughs> real closely, you see that it's still a terrible band. It's a terrible band. <laughs> um, <laughs> today on Easter Sunday, I want to talk about two men that almost missed Jesus, o almost missed that he was right in their presence, had to do a bit of a double take, and almost missed God walking with them. Now, personally, it is my conviction that Easter is all about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we're here to proclaim. Spoiler alert, that's what we are about. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote a, a letter to a church in a city called Corinth, and he said this. He says, if Christ has not been raised... Our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Now, some of you already think that about my preaching, and I understand. But essentially, I'm kidding. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> but I think Paul's right. If, if Jesus is still in the tomb, if he has not been raised, all of this is useless. Our small groups are useless. Our Bible studies are useless. Our mission trips are useless. Our buildings and websites, it's all useless. Without the resurrection, there is no savior, no salvation, no forgiveness of sins, and no hope of eternal life. Put another way, apart from the resurrection, Jesus was a very good but very dead man. And whether or not you buy all of this church stuff, listen, I understand. Some of you were dragged here. You were guilted here by grandma. I, I, I totally get it. It is hard at the very least to ignore that Jesus was and is massively significant. The name Jesus means God save, and Christ, not his last name, means anointed one of God. But Jesus of Nazareth was born to a poor teenage girl. His father was a peasant builder. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the small rural town that he was born in, never sold a book, never ran a company, never had any kids. In fact, he spent the first 30 years of his life in relative obscurity, likely swinging a hammer with his father. He died at the age of 33, eight years younger than I am right now, and yet no one has transformed the world more. Amen. In his wake is the largest legacy the world has ever known. More songs have been sung, paintings made, books sold about him than anyone else in history. Literally, B.C. stands for before Christ, A.D. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. History literally hinges on this man, Jesus. Now, when Jesus rose from the dead, those in Jerusalem and Judea, they did what we would do if we saw someone executed, buried in a tomb, and then a few days later, we're having breakfast with him. They started talking about it. Like we all would. They started talking about it, and they started writing it down. We can believe it because real people witnessed it, wrote about it, and believed it. We have four historical accounts of the resurrection. Matthew was an eyewitness and believed it. Mark got his information from Peter, an eyewitness who believed it. Luke, who thoroughly researched his gospel account, believed it. And John, a close friend and eyewitness, believed it. Peter wrote letters to the church. Paul traveled around the Mediterranean Rim planting churches. We even have historical examples like Tiberius, Julius Africanus, Phlegon, and Thallus, all confirmed at the very least darkness and or an earthquake around the time of Jesus' death. Something happened there. Celsus, a second century Greek philosopher and a fierce opponent of Christianity, by the way, made the first comprehensive attack on Christianity, trying desperately to resolve why Jesus was able to successfully perform miracles. But I think maybe the most compelling case is James. James is the brother of Jesus. Let me just ask you, 
what would your brother have to do to convince you he was God? Somebody, somebody, somebody was like, lie. Yeah. I, and we know that prior to his crucifixion and resurrection, James did not believe him. And that following the resurrection, he not only believed, he became a leader in the early church so much so that he was martyred for his faith. Today, at the very least, I want you to consider the resurrection of Jesus. Because most religions are built on either a philosophy or a collection of teachings. Christianity, however, is based on an event. That this man, Jesus, was crucified, buried, and rose again and is alive today. But apart from the resurrection, Jesus was a very good but very dead man. So a little bit of context to the Easter story. The ancient Jews believed that God was going to send a Messiah specifically to restore Israel to its previous glory. And year after year, nothing. And they would share these stories and they would wait longingly, nothing. And in the first century, they're under the boot of Rome. And then this strange rabbi comes on the scene. And he like, he like preaches with authority and he speaks in parables and rhymes. And at one point he takes a coin out of a fish's mouth and that was weird for everybody. Like Jesus is confounding everybody and crowds begin to gather and this makes the authorities nervous. But when he raised Lazarus from the dead, that was kind of the last straw. Jesus was then betrayed by a close friend, condemned by the temple, crucified by the empire, prepared for burial, and sealed in a tomb. And at this point, the game seems over, right? There's no story to keep alive. There's no movement to keep moving. There's nothing to hold on to. And here's what Luke records happened next in 24 verse 1. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Now, what I love is each of the gospel writers includes some version of the time of day. John says, while it was still dark. Matthew says, it was just before dawn. Mark says, as the sun was rising. All of them are saying, Easter happens when it's still dark. Easter happens when it's still dark. Maybe you're in a place or a season where things feel very dark for you. Easter happens when you cannot yet see the sun on the horizon. Now, all accounts say it happened on the first day of the week. And in the Bible, the first day always marks the beginning of something new. It's like a restart. It's a new chapter. Something entirely different is happening here. Easter marks the end of the previous era and the beginning of something new. So I want you to put yourself in the shoes of these, these women for a second. What must that have been like? It was Sunday morning and they made their way to the tomb. Women were the first to the tomb, by the way. And they bring with them spices. Why? Not because they planned on cooking with Jesus. But they, they planned on embalming him. On honoring their now executed friend. In other words, they went to the tomb fully expecting to find a body. And here's what happened next. They found the stone rolled away, but there was no body. A stone weighing somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000 pounds that was guarded by a soldier moved. Two men dressed in clothes that looked like lightning were standing there, and they asked the women, why do you look for the living among the dead? It's so tempting, isn't it, to look for life in dead places. Some of us perhaps know all too well the dead end things that we have pursued, thinking it would deliver on what it promised only to come up empty. Many people are still looking for Jesus among the dead, but he is not there, and they went to go share the news. Again, women, the first to proclaim the resurrection to the world. This is the good news of Easter, that Jesus has conquered sin and death in the grave. He rose from the dead on Easter morning, and he offers new life to you and me. Regardless of where you're at, regardless of what story brought you to this moment, regardless of where you're watching from or at emotionally or spiritually, new life for all of us. The Bible tells us that those of us who trust in Jesus will share in his resurrection. The fear of death and judgment and shame is taken away. Now, this is typically for a lot of people where the Easter story kind of ends. Maybe at this point you're like, yeah, I've heard this story a million times. Like, where are we going with this? There's another part of the story just a few verses later that I'd like for us to consider. Because many of the disciples at this point are filled with joy, and yet for others, they were still filled with uncertainty. Like some could not bring themselves to believe it. 
You have to imagine these rumors began to spread throughout Jerusalem. Like, hey, they went to go look for Jesus and he wasn't there and this stone was rolled away and there's something about guys with lightning clothes. I don't know what that's all about. Like, rumors began to spread and the body of Jesus of Nazareth was missing from the tomb. Had someone taken his body? Had the disciples stolen it? Was Mary mistaken? Was he really resurrected? So today is a story of two men. After the crucifixion, they were understandably disappointed. This was not the ending that they had anticipated. And again, I want you to put yourself in their shoes. They had likely sold all of their belongings. They had left everything they had known to follow this rabbi. They had believed, could this actually be the one that we've been longing for for centuries? And their hopes are dashed. There are rumors of this resurrection, but they're not quite sure they can believe it. So then we come to verse 13 in Luke 24. It says, now that same day, the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing them. So what are they talking about? They're talking about the same things that you and I would be talking about. Like, it was all anyone could talk about, and they're included in that. Imagine that you sold your possessions, given everything to follow this man. You thought he was for real. And then you hear some stories about a, about a possible resurrection, but these two men, for whatever reason, say, you know what, enough is enough. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't go through there. So they pack up and they head out. And on this road, do they see Jesus? Yeah. But do they recognize him? No. And those are two very different things. So Jesus was there, but they could not recognize him. And I don't know why. Maybe it was because of their disappointment. Maybe it was because of their discouragement. Maybe, honestly, it was their disillusionment with all of it that kept them from seeing Jesus. And and maybe for some of us, that describes perfectly the place that you're in today. Feeling discouraged or disillusioned or not sure what to make of this whole Jesus Bible church thing. These two men were not aware that God himself was walking with them. And here's, here's what I'm convinced of. This might be weird to say on Easter Sunday. I'm convinced of this. What you need is not one more sermon. What you need is not one more song, one more philosophy, one more principle. What you and I all need more than anything is to recognize Jesus in our midst to have our eyes open that God is here. I would argue there is no greater thing for any of us to experience. God wants to meet us right in our circumstances, right where we're at, whatever road that you are on. Now, Jesus could have done a lot of things in the hours immediately after his resurrection. I was thinking about it this week. Like, this is an odd choice for Jesus, isn't it? Like, he could have appeared to the highest court of any land anywhere. He could have appeared to Rome and Caesar. He could have appeared to the Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin. He could have appeared in the temple. But interestingly enough, Jesus spent a great portion of his first day as the resurrected king simply walking down a road. Now, the road to Emmaus was a seven-mile, two-and-a-half-hour journey that leaves Jerusalem. It represents people who followed Jesus as long as they could, but then shock or disillusionment derails them. Their heart is heavy. And maybe you've been there, and maybe you're there right now. Maybe it was everything you could possibly do to put on your Sunday best and put a smile on for the few minutes that we're together, but inside maybe you find yourself hopeless. These two disciples knew all the right things. They had followed Jesus, learned from Jesus, but had not yet taken hold of their heart. My guess is that explains a lot of us today. Maybe someone explained everything to you about Jesus, but you have not seen Jesus, beheld Jesus for yourself. And so all you have, you think, maybe are like these nice stories that are a little interesting, but they haven't taken hold of your life, and maybe you find yourself somewhere on this road. In between everything you expected and what you still long for, that's what Emmaus is. Expectation and what your hope still longs for, the liminal space, the in-between. So Jesus is on this road with these travelers, and my question is, is why? 
Like, why, why would he do this? Of all the things he could do. And I think there's a lot of reasons, not the least of which I think Jesus is modeling something for us. Because the truth is, all of us are on a road of some kind. We're all on a journey of some kind. We're all, in a sense, on that road to Emmaus. And there are many of us who, while we have heard about Jesus, we have not yet comprehended who he actually is. And that is the heart of Jesus, to know you personally and for you to know him personally. Not just intellectual assent. Jesus, from the beginning, has always been the one who came to seek people on their journey, wherever you might be. So the story goes on, verse 17. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, this story, by the way, is full of irony. Like, I love this question from Jesus. He's asking a question that he already knows the answer to. But asking questions seems very central to the character of Jesus. In fact, in the Gospels, of the 183 questions he's asked, he answers only three. It's like kind of how my relationship is with my toddler. Like, I feel like I never <laughs> get straight answers. Anyone else know what I'm talking about? Of the 183 he's asked, he answers only three, and yet he asks 307 questions. Jesus loves to ask questions, to peel back the layers and get to the heart of what's really going on. And when Jesus asks, he listens, not only to them, but to us. And here's how they respond. They stood still, their faces downcast. They're discouraged, they're heartbroken. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? <laughs> The, the irony is so thick here, isn't it? It's like, not only does Jesus know what happened, he is what happened. Like, he's fully aware of what is going on. But what did Jesus do when he joins them on their journey? He first listens to them. He asks a simple, open-ended question, and then actually listens to their answer. And of course, he already knew, but he still listens. I think this reminds us a lot about Christianity. And just to say it, I don't know that the church has necessarily done a great job in this department. Sometimes it's so easy for us to come like triumphalistically and we want to like, you know, I think we mean well oftentimes, but have we actually learned how to listen to people in their pain, in their discouragement, in their disillusionment? Have we actually suspended judgment for a moment to hear what made you you? What brought you to this place? Jesus is modeling something I think really beautiful and yet we so often want to skip this step. This means sometimes maybe we need to open ourselves up to someone else's pain, to listen, to be present with them. This, I believe, is the first step in showing the love of Jesus to others. It's just presence. Presence is the medium of love. And it goes on. Jesus said this, what things? I, lo I love this so much. It's, it's, I like to call this sassy Jesus, right? Like, can't you... Can't you picture just like a little side eye like, hmm, what thing? I don't know why I did this with my shoulders. I don't <laughs> What things? Like he's almost, he's almost egging them on. What I love though is that, again, he doesn't begin with a proclamation but a question. What are you discussing? What are you talking about? What things? Here's what they say. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. So these two men kind of show their hand here. I think we see now why they couldn't recognize Jesus for who he was. Because to them, crucifixion was not a victory. Understandably so. They had longed for Jesus to be this military conquering hero and then he's executed. For them, crucifixion was the ending of everything they had hoped for. And Jesus gives them space to share their story, to express their pain, to speak their disappointment. Again, Christ followers, we have not done a great job of this. And actually allowing people to peel back the curtain for a second. And explain what hurt or shame or pain they carry. I think we could learn a lot from Jesus here. He's not afraid of their pain or put off by their disappointment. But I want you to focus on, on three simple words that he said here. We had hoped. I love being a pastor. 
And for the last 20 years, I've heard those three words more times than I can count. Maybe you find yourself in that place today. We had hoped. We had hoped the tumor wasn't malignant. We had hoped that our marriage would last. We had hoped that our son would come home. We had hoped that the depression would lift. We had hoped to carry the baby to term. We had hoped to keep our jobs. We had hoped that healing would come. Many of us, I believe, are on the Emmaus Road uttering those same words. We had hoped. And so followers of Jesus, we walk alongside other people on their Emmaus Road. Not as experts, by the way, but as humans. As fellow sinners, fellow strugglers, pointing people to a better way. When those in our life or ourselves say we had hoped, we point to the one in whom our hope rests. And so these two men, they explain that the women had told them that the tomb was empty. And that even some companions of theirs had seen Jesus. But they weren't sure they could believe. And then Jesus offers this gentle rebuke. And then he teaches them from scripture in verse 26. He said, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? He's not drawing from Old Testament texts. And in Luke's gospel, three stories happen in one day. And they all follow the same pattern. People are disappointed. They're corrected. They're taught God's word. And then they go and tell. On that first Easter, Jesus makes himself known using the word of God. No amount of intellect or philosophy or illustrations apart from the Bible will tell us what the resurrection actually means. What is the message of Easter? Not simply that someone rose from the dead. I mean, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The message is that the crucified one rose from the dead. The one who was made sin on our behalf. The one who stood in our place. The one who was rejected by the world. So that when we are inclined to say we had hoped, we recognize that the, the final authority in what is true is not what I see with my eyes, but what God declares in his word. That even when I feel the weight of we had hoped, I can, I can rest and trust in Christ. A dead Messiah can't bring any kind of liberation. But the resurrection is the decisive declaration that the debt has been paid. Amen. Whatever that debt might be for you, whatever burden you carry, it's the great reversal. And we are now invited to walk free with him. And this is revealed specifically at the table. Verse 30 when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were, what's the word? Opened. And they recognized him. And then he disappeared from their sight. So right before this, and I love this part of the story because Jesus is walking with them and it says that he like pretended that he had to keep going further. And these two men are like, you can't, keep, you can't keep walking, it's late, come stay with us. They urge him to stay with them. He agrees and joins them at a table. He takes bread gives thanks, and breaks it. When was the last time Jesus did this? It was Passover. The Last Supper. The table of Jesus. The symbols he gave them to internalize the story of his broken body and shed blood. He's hidden on the road, but revealed at the table. This is when the lights come on for them. God is present at the table. He's known in the breaking of bread and the sharing of meals. Jesus is best known in community. It is not about going to some ivory tower and trying to cross every T and dot every I. The disciples on the road connect the word and the meal. Their eyes are opened around the table and their lives were never the same. In fact, as soon as their eyes are open, they realize they've been walking with Jesus. They got up and they rushed back to Jerusalem to tell everyone what they had seen and experienced. Think about that. A seven-mile journey in the evening with the day almost over. But they went and they went eagerly to proclaim the risen Christ, and so should we. When we recognize Jesus in our midst, we should always go with a sense of urgency to share our faith and love to our neighbor, to do everything that Jesus has commanded us to do. After our eyes have been opened to see our risen Lord, how can we do any less? Because the resurrection, by the way, is not just some future ticket to a far off place. The resurrection is for now. 
for right here, right now. Do not think of Jesus merely as the door to some afterlife in heaven in a far off place. Think of him as the door to new creation possibilities right here and now. Salvation is not just for someday, it's for today. Maybe you've never actually heard that or considered that. My prayer is today that you would receive that. In fact, the primary word that Jesus used over and over again as a synonym for salvation was life. He says in John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the, what's it say? Full, life abundant right here and now. The greatest miracle that can happen in our life is not for God to change our circumstances, but to change our heart in our circumstances. To see him in the midst of whatever road that we are walking to. Behold, God has been with me the whole time. God, open our eyes to your presence, even in my disillusionment, even in my disappointment. The abundant life is not when everything is good. It's when we're in the midst of our Emmaus Road journey and he shows up and we see him. That's the abundant life. What Jesus offers to his first followers, he offers to you and I a life that is truly life. Abundant life, full life, full of presence and power. But even though we live in an Easter world, many of us still feel as if we're walking a Good Friday road. Some of us, maybe we think it's It's over. Like these two travelers, we're convinced that hope is lost, that the ending has been written, that there's nothing left to accept the inevitable, but maybe, maybe for you it's something unexpected in your marriage, or your career, or your health, or your finances, or your relationships, or your kids. Maybe, maybe maybe you're at the top, and you've accomplished everything you've ever hoped for, and yet you still have this nagging sense This has not fulfilled the way that I thought that it would. This has not delivered on the promise that I was given. But simply put, Easter means that nothing is impossible with God. That life triumphs over death, that love triumphs over hatred, that hope triumphs over despair, and that suffering does not get the last word. Maybe it took everything in you to be here today. I mean, I, I, I'm so glad that you're here. And may, maybe what best describes how you feel in this moment is just empty. Easter declares that an empty tomb means we don't have to have an empty life. Because the tomb is empty, there is hope. God, open our eyes to your presence in our midst. So here's my invitation. It's not clever or catchy. It's simply this, to say yes to Jesus. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the millionth time. Saying yes is not just yes to knowing him, but trusting in him, following him, becoming a disciple and apprentice. It's not getting all the right answers, praying a right prayer, doing enough good things. It's simply receiving saying, God, this is all I have. Maybe this is the first time anyone's ever asked you that. Maybe you've asked it before but never thought you were enough or that your past was too much. I want you to know that Jesus invites you regardless of where you're at on this road. So real quickly, I want us to, I want us to do something together. If you would, just pull out your, your cell phone, pull out your smartphone. And I'd like for every single person to do this, by the way. If you're here with a a spouse or a community, I would love for every person to do this. Pull out your phone, and I want you to go to this link right here. And this link is going to bring you to a page. And we do this every Easter, by the way, for a couple of reasons. But it would be so helpful. We would just love to know not only how, how we can be praying for you, how we can come alongside you, and this is not signing you up for some email list. We'll, we'll reach out to you one time just to walk alongside you as best we can. You got four options. A is I'm already a follower of Jesus. If that's you, just select A. It'll bring you to a short form. And we just love to, to know how we can serve you better and come alongside you. Praise God. B is I want to I want to become a follower of Jesus. Like I felt this nagging maybe for the first time and maybe for the last few weeks, but now it's crystal clear. Like that is the path. I, I need to recognize or I have recognized Jesus in my midst. I want to become a follower of Jesus. We would, we would just love to come alongside you. Maybe you're here today, you're like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm still not sure, but I'd love to consider it more. Go ahead and hit C. We would love to have a conversation with you. 
hear your questions, do exactly what Jesus has done on this road here. And then D, and this is intentional, if you're here and you're like, man, I don't intend to do any of that, would you still, would you still hit D? If you'd be willing, we would still love to pray for you, pray with you, offer any help or resources we could. Wherever you're at, though, would you select one of those right now and just select the best answer that applies to you? Every single one of us has some kind of next step on this road that we are walking. And I want you to know that we exist as a church to be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world. Not for our sake, for the sake of the world. And the only reason that we can do that is because of the good news of Easter. Because the debt has been paid. If that were a receipt, it would look something like this. Sin, paid. Shame, paid. Pain, paid. Past mistakes, rejection, loneliness, slavery to sin, spiritual death. Guess what you owe? Nothing. Jesus didn't pay the mathematical majority. Jesus paid it all. Whatever you bring to the table, whatever weighs on you, whatever's maybe been swirling in your head, even as I'm talking, the debt has been paid. That's what we're all about. That's what Easter is all about. And the invitation is for you, for all of you. We're all invited to the table. If you're single, married, divorced, widowed, rich, or poor, you're invited. Fussy infants and gray-haired veterans, you're invited. If you can sing like an angel or couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, you're invited. If you're church shopping, just woke up, just got out of jail or still in jail, you're invited. If you're more religious than the Pope or haven't been to church since Aerosmith was good, you're <laughs> invited. If you're over 70 but not growing up yet or a teenager that's growing up too fast, you're invited. We invite you soccer moms, ESPN dads, starving artists, tree huggers, oat, almond, soy, cashew, latte sippers, vegans, and junk food eaters. This invitation is for those currently in recovery or still addicted. You're invited. Regardless of your sexual past, proclivity, or orientation, you are invited. You're invited if your heart is light, heavy, or downright in the dumps. If you're right wing, left wing, or don't care for the bird at all, you're invited. We welcome those who don't like organized religion or had Christianity shoved down your throat, you're invited. If you blew all your money at the casino, you're invited. You're invited if you work too hard, work too little, or don't work at all. If you're inked, pierced, both, or neither, you're invited. You're invited if you could desperately use prayer right now, were guilted by grandma to come today, or got lost in traffic and wound up here by mistake. <laughs> we invite you, tourists, seekers, doubters, zealots, bleeding hearts, to join us on this journey. Will you join us? Because here's the truth. No matter what road you're on, Jesus keeps catching up to us. May our eyes be opened so that we can recognize Jesus in our midst. May we always be eager to share the joy of his resurrection and his presence among us to the glory of God. Amen. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at BridgeChurchTN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.